Okay. Um, for them to, for use of, for use by the subjects and depending upon their needs. Over this, you can see that this is signature guide, the small things. I give it to patient to practice at home. It is just like in, in wooden. I, and I call them at my clinic twice a week. So they practice at home. And another thing is called Notex. It has curved. You, the patient can memorize how many curvatures are at per denominations. It's called Notex to, uh, to, know, to count the currencies. Signature guide to, uh, for sign making signatures. And the patient satisfaction was rated among one scale of one five, and being least at five, being most satisfied. A majority of the patients reported a high satisfaction with 95% rating a satisfaction scale of 4% and above. Thank you. I need a blessing to move forward in the lab. Rudro Bhai. Like to hold further, Rudro. I think he needs some help. Yeah. Rudro, I'm our junior. So completed well in time. We really appreciate Dr. Ashwini, sir. He has been making great efforts in spite of his limitations for low vision patients. The next speaker which we have is Dr. Radhika Chandan. The topic is a study of prevalence and risk factors for dry eye in adults over 40 years of age. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the study is um, related to the prevalence and risk factors for dry eye in adults over 40 years of age in India. It was funded by the Indian Council of Medical Research. It was a multi-center study involving several institutes all over the country. Uh, the background information is that dry eye, as we all know, is a multifactorial disease. The global prevalence varies from 5% to 75%. It affects the quality of life and has an effect on health expenditure. There has been a wide variation in Indian studies in, in terms of the um, reported prevalence, and all of these have been clinic-based. There are influences of environmental factors, such as sunlight exposure, air pollution, et cetera, but they are still inconclusive. And hospital-based studies may not directly translate um, into a public health perspective. So the review of literature has shown that definitely environment does have a role. Some of the risk factors include sunlight as a significant association with her, which has been shown also with smoking and excessive windy conditions. But as I explained before, um, the, uh, the studies in other countries have included some uh, epidemiological work. In India, it has largely been hospital-based. So there are no epidemiological studies in Indian population on the prevalence and association of dry eye disease, especially environmental factors such as sunlight exposure and air pollution. And that was the objective, to assess the actual prevalence in the population per se and look at the associated factors. It was a cross-sectional study done over a period from 2010 to 23, a population age over 40 years in different geographical regions, including rural and urban. And demographic details and de further details about their lifestyle were assessed. Um, we took patients who were usually resident of the area defined because geographical area was one of the factors uh, were taken into account and those willing to participate. Patients who were not willing or declined consent were not included. So here are the results. The overall prevalence across all the areas was 34.6%. Uh, we did not find any significant difference in males and females. There was a higher prevalence uh, the older the age, and urban was uh, more than rural. And the desert areas such as Jaisalmer and uh, northern plains in the Delhi area were higher than the northeast Guwahati. Uh, as I explained before, the prevalence increased with age. And uh, with the study area, we found slightly higher in urban than rural. The difference was statistically significant. Looking at the study locations, there was a variation because several factors were uh, involved in the different geographic locations. They were also in terms of altitude as well as the um, extent of exposure to humidity and so on. 
So the associations with modifiable risk factors showed that cumulative sun exposure, where well, we did not find a significant association on univariate and multivariate analysis. Tobacco smoking was found to be uh, significant on univariate analysis only. Indoor smoke exposure, including past and present, was significant. Diabetics were also significant in a univariate analysis, and hypertension showed no association. So as a, uh, um, uh, 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 overall, the pre prevalence has been shown to be higher in India compared to the other population-based studies in other countries. Um, the new finding in India was that we did not find any difference between males and females. The age, as we have shown again, is a very important risk factor for dry eye. This has a very important clinical relevance. And also the area type, the, the type of place where a person lives, the location, as well as the sunlight exposure. Tobacco smoking, as such, was not found significant on multivariate analysis showing that there are multiple factors at play, and uh, diabetes showed a significant association. So dry eye prevalence is higher in Indian population compared to, to the other population-based studies. It is associated with age, urban residence, certain geographic uh, locations, tobacco smoking, indoor smoke, as well as diabetes, and public health interventions such as lifestyle environmental modification could um, impact the burden of the dry eye disease in India. The strength of the study was it, is that it was a multicenter epidemiological study with a very large sample size and was the first study of its nature in our country. There were limitations because we did not have individualized data for each patient, and influence of systemic and topical medications were not assessed, and emerging risk factors such as digital screen exposure were also not taken into account. Uh, those are the references. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a nice presentation, ma'am. If any questions, my co-judges have. Audience, any questions? Uh, we did not in include COVID, uh, but we continue the study during the COVID time period, uh, but it was not included, no. Industrial and non-industrial areas were uh, found out. Um, the trouble when one does these epidemiological studies is when you calculate the sample size to keep uniformity, we had urban and rural, and the uh, urban areas were, un uh, were um, uh, generally in the city. So we, in that subgroup analysis of industrial and non-industrial, it was not uh, included. So it's very extremely expensive, and it was first to do a, a, you know find the baseline data, and then smaller studies can be done to specifically look because here a very large sample size, very large area was covered, and so it has pointed out that there's certain um, things which are important. So the next would be to do smaller uh, um, uh, specific associations, areas. specific areas. That's right. Ma'am, why you selected 40 years as a cutoff age? Yes, uh, again, because um, we, we have uh, a separate data of less than 15 years of age correlated with VKC, um, but uh, more than 40 was taken because of the general review of literature showed that dry eye comes more at this and epidemiologically, and then you had to calculate the budget and the most cost-effective way of, of finding the information, that is why. Next presenter is Dr. Priyanka Agund. Our topic is essentiality of universal neonatal eye screening. And the chief author is Dr. Smita Singh. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, myself, uh, Dr. Priyanka Agund, as a junior resident from the MGMS Sevagram. I'm here to present uh, essentiality of the universal neonatal eye screening. The question is, universal eye screening, why? Neonates are not able to express themselves for any ocular disorders as that of adults. Newborn eye screening as, uh, at birth has great impact in reducing the long-term visual impairment because of the early identification of the ocular abnormalities. Universal eye screening approach can be useful for early detection of ocular mobilities. Neonates in which early clinical intervention for diseases which require the treatment can influence and improve the visual clinical outcomes. Aim and objective is to uh, find the ocular abnormalities uh, in a neonate using universal eye screening, also to estimate the incidence of any ocular morbidities in a neonate. It is a uh, prospective observ observational study in which the inborn neonates in the postnatal care ward and neonatal intensive care unit was in a tertiary care hospital was screened for any ocular morbidities in during a period of six months. These are some pictures uh, while uh, taken from during screening. Informed consent was taken from the parent of the guardians. These are some consent forms. 
demographic details like history, unique ID, gestational age, chronolo chronological age, sex, birth weight, current weight, and date of birth. Also, mode of delivery was noted uh, and collected in a pre-designed performa, which was uh, seen there. Torchlight examination of Android segment was done for any ocular structure or abnormality like eyelid coloboma, congenital ptosis, eyelid entropion, capillary hemangioma, etc. Also, uh, corneal uh, opacities, congenital cataract, uh, congenital glaucoma, and the other globe abnormalities like anophthalmos, bifthalmos was diagnosed. These are some clinical pictures uh, we are getting from the, during torchlight examination during the screening. Uh, as a result, uh, we screen during a period of six months 2410 neonates for any ocular uh, abnormality uh, out of out of which 52.61 were males and 48.38 were females. 53.23 was born by normal vagina delivery and 46.76% were born by lower, lower segment sections. We found that the incidence of congenital dacrocystitis was maximum, that is 19%, followed by the fundus abnormality, which is 11.11%, ophthalmic neonatrum, 2.44%, and the facial abnormality was found to be 0.12%. Using RBSK guideline, that is the Rashtriya Val Swastha Sarikram guideline, most commonly detected abnormality during the screening was congenital dacrocystitis. Facial abnormalities like anophthalmos, facial palsy, congenital ptosis, cleft leaf, and cleft palate was also found. Anti segment finding like subconjunctal hemorrhage, conjunctal congestion, conjunctivitis, ectopia, UVA, ophthalmic neonatrum, etc., was also found. Most common fundus abnormality which is found during the screening was ROP followed by the retinal hemorrhage. Management ocular conditions like congenital dacrocystitis was treated initially by teaching the mother or the grandmother to give the Gregorian massage to teach them how to uh, take a lead hygiene and prescribing the local antibiotics. Anti-segment abnormality was treated appropriately uh, by local application of the antibiotics. Facial abnormality was diagnosed earlier and planned to be a suitable approach in consultation with the pediatrician or a surgeon. Most commonly fundus abnormality was ROP uh, and those who were requiring a laser or intravitreal treatment was given to prevent the blindness. Screening in the early newborn period is important because the prognosis for the same condition depend on the early detection and early treatment. Screening prevent the developmental delay in a neonate during infancy and promote the neonatal health as it identifies any factor which block the pupillary uh, pathway resulting in the abnormal red reflex. It concludes that red reflex is a, is a test which is easy, simple to perform and non-invasive, requires minimal equipment and can detect the many ocular abnormalities. Early detection by torchlight examination may help in preventing the ocular morbidity and will decrease the blindness in a neonate, leading to decrease in the childhood blindness. Hence, the neonatal eye screening is essential for every birth of the neonate. These are some references which I used. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Smith, well presented. The only problem I find is population in developing countries in India. So if we start doing neonatal screening, then maybe the load of on ophthalmologists will be even more, and I don't know whether it will be practically feasible or not. But well presented anyways. What was the population? What was the sample which you took for this? Uh, it is uh, During a period of six months, we have a screen uh, 2410 new units, okay. which is inborn new units in mm -hmm. a tertiary care hospital of ours. OK, that is your hospital. Yeah, you my, my hospital. OK. Any questions from my co-judges? Any separate group for screening of ROP in your study? Uh, yes, sir. That is a uh, uh, ROP guideline uh, under RBSK. Uh, it's, it was a it was a hospital-based study. Yes, yes, ma'am. So, how would you extrapolate it to the community? Uh, we uh, screen the inborn uh, neonates, and uh, we would uh, like to, uh, like uh, we. Uh, Tell them that uh, promote the other peoples to uh, come over if there is any problem in the new net, like uh, any congenital problems, they, they will consult us in the our department. So did, he, did you have any uh, association with the pediatricians? Yes, yes, ma'am. In the yes. every Friday, we used to go on a every uh, on a daily basis. We used to go for one hour in the uh, postnatal care ward and also in the neonatal ICU for the screening uh, of the new units. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Venkat Meghna, heart 
topic is Depervasiveness and Frequency of Retinopathy of Prematurity in a Tertiary Center in Tamil Nadu. Hi, I'm Dr. Meghna. I'm here to present my paper, The Pervasiveness and the Frequency of Retinopathy of Prematurity in a Tertiary Care Center in Tamil Nadu. It's a vasoproliferative disorder of a developing retina in a low birth weight and a preterm infants. It was first uh, known as retrolenteral fibroplasia, which was later coined by Heath in 1951 as retinopathy of prematurity. It has become one of the global problem as being a most common cause of childhood blindness, especially in middle and low income economics. The risk factors and the disease prevalence are the key for shaping screening and treatment protocols in NICU care. The ROP prevalence in India is 20 to 52 percent of the screen neonates. The recent studies showed the lower rates of ROP due to increased in frequency of screening at about 20 to 30 percent of the babies. There were three epidemics. The first epidemic, which was seen in 1940s and 50s, which was due to introduction of neonatal care and unmonitored oxygen, and in 1980s, which was second epidemic, which was caused due to increased survival of extremely large birth weight babies and combined with minimal screening and which from 1990s there was seen a third epidemic which was due to increase access to the medical technology that allows earlier viability age and without postnatal level of care to counter preterm diseases. The aim is to study the prevalence and incidence of retinopathy of prematurity in tertiary healthcare center. It is a prospective hospital based observational study of 400 neonates including gestational age less than 34 weeks, birth weight less than 2,000 grams, and babies with RDS and long NICU stay with O2 support. A screened single trained ophthalmologist was screened ROP, performing plus 20D, was using indirect ophthalmoscope with plus 20D lens. Data on gestational age, birth weight, stage, and zone of involvement were collected and analyzed using appropriate statistic analysis. The distribution of ROP in our study is, uh, 70, is 7%. Subjects base, screened based on birth weight where 27% babies were extremely low birth weight, 33 were low birth weight and 40 were very low birth weight. They showed a significant association between extremely low birth weight babies and the stage disease. Comparatively, they show, they, there is no much association between stage and low birth weight babies. Based on uh, birth weight, based on gestational age, the there uh, twenty three percent of extremely preterm babies were considered, and uh, thirty four percent of early preterm and forty two percent of late preterm babies were considered. In that, there showed a significant association of thirty four percent of the babies of extremely preterm were found to have stage disease compared to late preterm, where there are only five percent. Uh, in relation with zone disease and stage, in relation with immature zone ROP and stage disease, the zone one is more associated with stage disease compared to zone three. To summarize, with association between occurrence of ROP and extremely low birth weight value showed great significance with a pre value less than 0 0.001, and there is significant association between stage of ROP and extremely preterm babies with a p value of less than 0 0.06. There is a strong relationship that was discovered between ROP stage and an underdeveloped zone 2 and zone 1 with a significant p-value and extremely low birth weight babies and extremely preterm babies were significantly correlated. To discuss with majority of the neonates screened for ROP were 32 to 36 weeks and less than 30, 30 weeks were 23 percent. Extremely low birth weight babies and extremely preterm neonates have higher risk of developing ROP. Earlier screening and timely interventions are crucial to prevent irreversible blindness. The study found a significant association between stage of ROP and extremely low birth weight and extremely preterm in line with the other studies. To conclude with, the findings of the study highlight the importance of early screening and management of ROP in neonates, particularly those born prematurely or with low birth weight. Close monitoring of at-risk infants, timely intervention and appropriate follow-up care and crucial, are crucial for preventing visual impairment associated with ROP. Healthcare providers should be vigilant in identifying high risk neonates and implementing evidence based protocols to reduce the burden of ROP related morbidity and improve long term visual outcomes. ROP remains a preventable cause of childhood blindness. Low birth weight babies and gestational age are significant risk factors for which frequent screening was required. 
these are the references consider yeah thank, thank you dr you. venkat meghna um, i would like to know that how is your study different from uh, other similar studies what are the strengths to your study um, mom the thing is we try to uh, screen the babies who are like uh, less than 20 less than 28 weeks of gestational age but the thing is the limitation of the study is we couldn't get multiple samples and the stage of the rop was also not found like we screened some five babies who are less than 28 weeks but we couldn't get uh, the stage disease in less than 28 even if the babies were less than 28 weeks they were having immature zone 1 with no stage no plus and all it's one of our limitations the strength of your study actually not limitation that how is your study different from the other similar studies um, okay it's just an addition to the literature, yeah, the literature. maybe okay the next author which we have is presenting author and chief author dr ankita tele consultation of thalmology reaching every nook and corner Good afternoon everyone I am Dr Ankita Thali and I am here to present tele consultation of thalmology of thalmology reaching every nook and corner So tele consultation refers to the use of technology to deliver Thank you Tele consultation refers to the use of technology to deliver healthcare remotely. Ophthalmology is a technologically forward field and the first project in tele ophthalmology was published in 1975 and of course it left a major impact during the COVID-19 pandemic. The aim of our study is to analyze the impact of tele consultation in India's rural community. Coming to subjects and methods, so these tele consultation units are set up in the rural communities and are referred to as vision centers or VC, and each one caters to a population of around twenty thousand to fifty thousand people. Each one is equipped with sit lamp, photo machine, uh, fundus photo machine, shiot stenometers, retinoscopes, uh, an optometrist, and a good network for connectivity. Besides this, there are also spigmo manometers, glucometers, uh, electronic medical records, and an optical shop. So these optometrists basically take the history, perform the examination, take sit lamp photos and fundus photos, and send them to the doctors at the base hospital. So now coming to the base hospital setup, it consists of a, an exclusive room with uh, two computers uh, with good internet connectivity. At a time there are two ophthalmologists and two staff nurses. The tele consultation is then carried out with the help of two apps, mainly Skype and Remedio. So the video consultation is done with the help of Skype, and the photos are viewed with the help of the Remedio app. A systematic retrospective analysis was performed over a period of 18 months from April 2022 to September 2023 on data which was obtained from 41 such vision cent vision centers of our hospitals spread across nine states so these are our vision centers spread across India except in Coimbatore because in Coimbatore alone we have 17 vision centers The data included the number of patients that were examined, treated, and referred to the base hospitals, the demographic profile of these patients, the conditions that were being treated, and also the number of patients that underwent cataract surgery. So, what we found that the total patients we examined were one lakh ninety-one thousand one ninety-four, with an average of around ten thousand three sixty-six per month, and maximum number of patients was seen at Coimbatore, which is around forty-four point seventy-eight percent, again owing to maximum number of vision centers. Coming to the demographic profile, we found that most of our patients were females, and most of them were more than 60 years of age. And the visual acuity of patients that were presenting to us was between 660 and 3 by 60. That is, those with uh, those with severe visual impairment. Uh, presenting complaints most common was diminution of vision, and uh, coming to the diagnosis, most common was lens-related pathologies. But then again, like every other patient, uh, there were more than one presenting complaints and more than one diagnosis for every patient. Discussion. So, Bone et al. in 2020 found that with a population of 1,380 million, India had 270 million people living with vision loss, and 9.2 million were blind. In developed countries, the average ophthalmologist to population ratio is about 39 per million, whereas in India it is only 15 per million. What makes things worse is within the country itself there is a discrepancy, where in urban areas have got a, uh, one ophthalmologist for 10,000 people, whereas in rural area there is only one for every 250,000 people. So tele consultation can help to bridge this gap. We found that females were more than males, which was similar to Sabarwal et al., which could be due to the inability to travel long distances and also due to the social responsibilities of the females. Most of the patients were more than 60 years with severe visual impairment. I also found out the, the same results were by Mishra et al. Could be due to increased longevity of the population and also again due to difficulty in traveling for such old patients. 
So we found that about 19.75% of patients had cataract and were advised cataract surgery. And uh, among these, around 62% were below poverty line and underwent cataract surgery free of cost. 65,425 were uh, prescribed medications on uh, teleconsultation and found to have resolution of symptoms. And 30,840 were given glasses. By all of this, it is very clear that teleconsultation can help to reduce the burden on the healthcare system. Also, posterior segment pathologies, it is useful for diagnosis, referral, and treatment, and there are already studies that uh, show teleconsultation is useful for early diagnosis. Similarly, glaucoma, which is an irreversible cause, it helps for early diagnosis, and there are already studies proving this. Uh, however, we cannot overlook the limitations, which are obviously the cost effectiveness. The initial cost of setting up a vision center is very high, but overall the long-term benefit is much more. Uh, poor network connectivity in rural areas is another limiting factor, and difficulty in diagnosis of certain conditions with teleconsultation alone becomes difficult. But we cannot forget the benefits. That is benefit to, uh, beneficial to both ophthalmologists and patients, and it aids in case-based reference. Most studies show high satisfaction and acceptance level among both ophthalmologists as well as patients. Public awareness is uh, increased and it improves the health-seeking behavior of the patients. Furthermore, we can also do, have post-operative care and follow-up. To conclude, teleophthalmology serves as a good eye care delivery channel. It provides preventative, curative, and promotive eye care services in a sustainable way. No doubt it became a major source of access to healthcare during the COVID-19 pandemic. But now, even during the post-COVID-19 pandemic era, it is here to stay. Thank you. So, Dr. Ankita, you're from uh, which hospital? I missed that slide. It was not here. You're from Arvind? Or? Uh, Shankarai Hospital, Coimbatore. Okay, so you're lucky to be in a hospital where they can afford to have uh, yes, fundus camera and uh, slit lamp camera yes, in vision centers yes, also because in many of the government hospitals as yet we do not have that True, in ophthalmology units. Yes, ma'am. So, yeah, teleophthalmology is a concept that has been going for that has been going on for some years and during COVID it uh, got an upsurge. Any questions from my co-judges or audience? What do you think as the future? Exclusive teleophthalmology consultation or teleophthalmology as an additional tool to, tool to clinical examination or as a follow-up? So as mentioned as one of my limitations that we cannot diagnose certain conditions yes. with teleophthalmology alone. So it can be an adjunct to the regular consultation, yes. particularly in the rural areas. Fine. So the next thank speaker. You. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ankita. Next speaker is Dr. Divya Rao. Harnessing AI, that's automated imaging to prevent ROP blindness. ROP is a hot topic. It's the third presentation, I think, on ROP we have in this session. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Divya Rao, and I'll present our uh, analysis on a real-world study that evaluated an AI for ROP screening. Here are my disclosures. Um, I lead the AI development at Remedio, where this technology was developed along with uh, the Kidrop team led by Dr. Anand Vinikar, and this was conducted under the BIRAC grant. India has three and a half million preterm babies born annually, the highest anywhere in the world, and is the leading cause of preventable infant blindness. And compounding this problem is that there is an acute shortage of ROP specialists in India, less than 200. So technology like AI can really help bridge this gap and allow for a paradigm shift in screening using um, this technology. So essentially, it can empower nurses, trained operators, and even neonatologists with a tool that can help them refer babies with ROP. And this can be combined with or without teleophthalmology. So we developed uh, an ROP algorithm that looked at presence or absence of disease. We used over 200,000 wide field images from multiple camera systems that were obtained from the KidDrop program. And we used an assistive model to actually s sort out the temporal images. We used this for training. The ground truth came from uh, the KidDrop program. And we um, essentially also looked at how this model did on internal test data sets, and the uh, results were very promising. But the next step was really to look at how this model was actually doing in the field. So to evaluate this model, uh, image-based automated AI to screen for ROP in premature babies. We looked at 329 at-risk infants uh, who met the inclusion and exclusion criteria. This was conducted across several screening centers which use multiple camera systems, and we uh, divided them into one, two, and three, where Neo cameras were used, RedCam 3 as well as RedCam Shuttle. 
we compared the AI that uses temporal images for diagnosis to uh, screen presence of di absence of ROP against two benchmarks. The first benchmarks was field diagnosis by expert graders, and also we looked at comparing the AI against consensus image grading by ROP ex by two ROP gra uh, trained graders, and was also adju adjudicated by an expert. So we recruited 304 at-risk infants with a mean birth weight of uh, 1,690 690 grams with a gestation of 32 weeks. And as you can see here, when we compare the algorithm against the field diagnosis or consensus image grading, the sensitivity and specificity were comparable, over 90%, and the specificity close to 82%. The false negatives were primarily stage one ROP, uh, and there were no missed cases of AROP. And the Cohen's kappa amongst the graders was very promising at 0.84. The representation of newer cameras was more. As you can see, majority of the data was, um, was from this system with comparable data across the three and the shuttle. And the sensitivity across all were encouraging, but the sensitivity was highest on the newer camera system. And the specificity was marginally lower on this system. Here is a visualization of the results of true positives. As you can see, the heat maps point to the area of diagnosis. Um, visual, it's, it acts as a visual check. And on the left a fault is an example of a false negative case, which was a stage one ROP case. In the middle is a false positive case, where you see the heat maps over the vascular areas. And on the right is a true negative case. So the ROP AI screening algorithm demonstrated encouraging results, achieving sensitivities and specificities exceeding 90% and 82%. We use very stringent benchmarks, both field diagnosis as well as image grading. This promising generalizability across the camera systems. The false negatives were primarily missed stage one disease in zone three, and the false positives could be further minimized by reducing the number and quality of images captured on on the temporal quadrant, as the AI here needed only one image to be positive, and this was the real challenge for the AI. The strengths, this is a real world prospective validation, one of its kind, the first in India, and as I mentioned, we use stringent uh, benchmarks, and we use multiple camera systems. One of the limitations was equal distributions across camera systems, but this was practically challenging, because the NEO was the one which was used most in the field. And as the next steps, we are looking to also validate a treatment triaging model that could specifically also pick up plus disease, and this is ongoing. So just to conclude, this innovative algorithm. Dr. Rajvinder Kaur, with her study on association of postnatal risk factor with progression of ROP in preterm twin neonates. Good afternoon, everyone. So my topic is the association of postnatal risk factors with the occurrence and progression of ROP in preterm twin in neonates. So the ROP is a complex disease of the developing retinal vasculature in infants born prematurely. Recent advances in the areas of NICU have improved the survival rates of preterm in infants, thereby increasing the incidence of ROP. And uh, the incidence has already, uh, uh, already been covered. So the main aim was to evaluate the influence of weight gain per day with the progression of ROP in preterm to in neonates. Uh, so uh, the other risk factors, prematurity, twins, mechanical ventilation, oxygen therapy, sepsis, they were also taken into account for the development of uh, ROP. So the postnatal, the, that is the weight gain per day involved in the progression of ROP was seriously looked at. And uh, it is a case control study, observational, and perspective studies, uh, as well as the taking the retrospective and prospective data in a tertiary care hospital. So in the inclusion criteria, babies, twin neonates less than 35 weeks, the, uh, according to the weight less than 1750, uh, and uh, less than 2000 when there is associated risk factors. So the study subjects a total of 56 preterm twin subjects, that is 112 wise, after considering the risk factors were included. So selected twin ne neonate after getting uh, admitted in the NICU of pediatric department delivered in institutionally or outborn, they were uh, in, uh, obtained uh, after the consent from the attendants of the neonates were examined by the same ophthalmologist and data was recorded. 
and the after discharge the new nurses were followed in the opd of the pediatrics and ophthalmology department so the on regular screening it was observed that rop regressed in 46 eyes and all of which were good weight babies that is the weight gain was more than 14 g per day whereas the those babies with the poor weight gain they showed the progression of rop requiring the treatment so this is the ch chart which showed that babies uh, with the poor weight gain uh, along with the other risk factors it was mainly looked for that the poor weight gain they, uh, they there was progression of the rop but when the the weight gain is good uh, there was a regression from the uh, there was a reg uh, regressed rop so this was the overall data how 112 eyes excluded 16 eyes included 96 eyes and uh, that is 46 size there was a regression of rop and progression in 26 size which in in with these patients anti vegf and laser in 6 size laser alone in 17 size and three patients underwent three uh, that is uh, um, surgeries so this is a patient with the that is stay uh, stay uh, stay 3 zone 2 rop pre plus rop and laser done baby discharge with satisfactory conditions and here we can see the nasal rd on, on the nasal side and uh, uh, previously the la first of all the laser was done followed by the lens sparing vitrectomy in both eyes Has, there was one another child with the gracie avrop with the preretinal uh, bleed uh, the patient was injected anti vegf first followed by laser and followed by vitrectomy in the right eye at the um, and the, uh, it is a uh, while giving intravitreal injection the image is taken uh, showing the uh, tvl that is tunica vesiculosa lentis in uh, with the non dilating pupil so uh, we, uh, this study and nanya at all concluded in their study that poor weight gain and the low calorie intake at the second week of age were associated with severe rop requiring the laser treatment in very low worth weight baby so monitoring the weight gain and the calorie intake during this period they are essential and they may be the predictors uh, to for the uh, retinopathy of prematurity occurrence Uh, the other study also concluded that the postnatal weight gain is highly predictive of rop and investigators have incorporated weight gain uh, measures to develop the most specific criteria for rop screening so our study also shows the positive correlation between the weight gain uh, with the progression and regression of rop so we should aggressively work towards the rapid weight gain in preterm along with the help of neonatologist so parents counseling is very important Uh, to prevent the uh, side threatening sequelae of the rop thank you yeah dr rajwinder i um, could not get uh, the aim i think you compared the twin babies or why did you choose twin twin uh, actually we wanted to see uh, in the twins between some the twins. Uh, between the twins Okay. that why the some babies are uh, progressing and some babies are not progressing so we compared the twins okay and 16 eyes were excluded you told uh, uh, they were lost to follow up they they could not come to fo our follow up uh, on our center because they were far from uh, so we asked them to follow there only some so other center which is near to their place right so it is four set of twins yes okay right 30 patients who received etambutol and those who had no recognizable clinical symptoms or signs of objective visual impairment or abnormal eye examination patients who had any other disease causing optic neuropathy like uh, glaucoma optic neuritis were excluded any crystalline lens or retinal diseases cnstb and diseases that affect macular vessel density were uh, excluded and patients with uh, who had intake of other drugs causing optic neuropathy except uh, etambutol were also excluded they were subjected to complete ophthalmic examination at the start at 3 months and after 6 months of starting att they were subjected to oct and oct angiography scans after 3 months of starting att um through the course of treatment 17 patients had a decrease in visual acuity that is reduction in two or more lines of snellen chart and um color vision remained unaffected in uh, all patients uh, the slit lamp biomicroscopy and fundus examinations were normal Uh, between the two groups age was comparable however female showed uh, more of uh, visual impair impairment over the course of treatment uh, visual acuity was uh, compared in logmar units and uh, 17 patients showed a decrease in visual acuity the mean and standard deviation was obtained for uh, macular vessel density gcipl and peripapillary rnfl thicknesses 
and significant p-value was obtained in macular vessel density. Uh, while uh, GCIPL and RNFL didn't show significant decrease. While previous studies have proved that OCT offers a sensitive uh, biomarker of uh, GCIPL thickness as in clinical EON, uh, it couldn't uh, offer significant uh, uh, satisfactory result in uh, preclinical uh, stage. Uh, so it is speculated that, that, uh, that there is a minimum GCIPL thickness uh, which is tolerated by the GC, uh, retinal ganglion cells and screening at that time with a sensitive indicator uh, biomarker could help in uh, reducing visual impairment earlier. And from our study, we have picked up that uh, macular vessel density decreased significantly in these patients and can be used to uh, uh, detect visual impairment earlier. And a preventable uh, cause of uh, vision loss could be reduced by assessing uh, patients with uh, uh, OCT angiography in the preclinical stage. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Um, yeah, Dr. Ashwari, uh, Dr. Neela, yeah. yeah. So Dr. Neela, what is the practical um, application of this, like OCT and OCT angiography? There are so many patients who are getting ATT in India, so is it uh, feasible? What's the practical application of this? Um, we uh, attempt to provide an earlier a biomarker for uh, detecting uh, ethambutol toxicity. Uh, the limitations of, uh, of which can be the costlier uh, uh, investigation being OCT angiography and uh, the test being available only in uh, higher centers. So it needs uh, further studies to uh, detect uh, e even any uh, cheaper or uh, widely based uh, indicators in the population. So do you advocate this in your hospital? Like those who will be undergoing ATT, will you be doing OCT angiography for all? Uh, we are currently are advising uh, OCT, uh, just OCT, but uh, to detect earlier, we can uh, prescribe angiography also. As this cases primary goes to a general ophthalmologist, what are the basic test or tests you will advocate to advise for those patients? Uh, visual equity, color vision, uh, uh, contrast sensitiv sensitiv sensitivity. Uh, and which patients are to be referred for uh, OCT and OCT angiogram? Uh, patients uh, showing a, a drop in vision or a, a visual field uh, decrease. Thank you. Yeah, so the next author is Dr. Guzzle. Yeah, interesting name, and the topic is Revolutionizing Ocular Tuberculosis Treatment, COTS Calculator Optimization. So it is TB again. Good afternoon, everyone, respected judges. Myself, Dr. Gazal Patnaik, and I shall be presenting our work on Revolutionizing Ocular Tuberculosis Treatment through COTS Calculator and how to optimize this calculator for improved patient outcomes. So why the need of this? The purpose was that the prevalence was varied between the southern and the northern part of the India and that could be due to the lack of standardized diagnostic as well as a management criteria. So the exact incidence cannot be estimated accurately. So the primary objective was to evaluate the application of this collaborated ocular tuberculosis study calculator in real life settings and the secondary objective was to examine the two crucial components that is chest x-ray and the tuberculin skin test or the Montus test. We defined, uh, re defined these components and aim to enhance the overall accuracy of the COTS calculator. So it was a retrospective study from 2007 to 2016. All the ocular tuberculosis patients, those have received anti-tubercular therapy and had a minimum follow-up of six months after the stoppage or discontinuation of the ATT were included. And the primary objective was evaluated with the help of concordance rate and the secondary objective was evaluated with the utility of the other radiological test as well and appropriate statistical techniques were involved. So little bit about the COTS calculator. It is uh, easily available through online tools. You can just Google COTS calculator or oculartb.net and something like this comes up. 
patient details and the clinical findings if you put calculate something like this comes up as a result that guides in clear lines that what is the probability amongst the uvitis experts in international platform whether they would consider therapy of att or not so uh, let's have a look about uh, this uh, calculator nothing high fi or high science is needed just the basic requirement which a, a physician has at a primary healthcare level also can in uh, get this idea sitting at a remote area so you can see the name the age of the patient and all the different countries are also available here once you put all the details then you come to clinical phenotype whether it is anterior intermediate pan retinal vasculitis and similarly amongst them they have different subtypes so after that uh, you just have to put the details of these three tests that is tuberculin skin test igra and the chest x ray not necessarily everything uh, if you don't have they have the uh, parameters like positive negative or even not done so uh, after that you have a cl uh, clear reference that whether att needs to be started or not so from this we calculated the concordance rate and as you can see we evaluated between chest x ray and the hrct amongst the concordance and the discordance group and we found that if we took both of them the concordance rate is around 70% however if there is a strict adherence then it decreases to 33% also we noted that the phenotype is very important and the second important thing is multiple recurrences despite an adequate anti inflammatory therapy a sub optimal uh, anti inflammatory therapy could lead to multiple recurrences so that has to be taken into consideration and uh, serpiginous choroiditis has been most commonly associated systemic radio imaging apart from hrct or chest x ray that is gastrointestinal tuberculosis or cns tuberculosis could also help in providing supportive evidences other options could be include in this uh, online tool that is recurrences the value of the montu stays and other ocular investigations like polymerase chain reaction and biopsies so to conclude it not only depends upon the clinical features and the lab investigation we need to have the local epidemiological factors the availability of the drugs and the physician perspective so as to evaluate the efficacy and to reduce the emergence of the multi drug Uh, resistance of the att and this online calculator is a very valuable tool and with this proposed improvements could increase the accuracy as well as the relevance of the tool through in a nutshell this is very very economical you just need to have a mobile with a working network and in any part of nook and corner of the country you can get an idea how to proceed with that a patient who cannot go to higher centers thank these are my references thank you yeah so i can see that uh, there are some new references there are some indian studies also yes. they have been published in international journals so again the question is that how your study is different from those studies which you have mentioned in your references the or is it just an add on to the literature no ma'am this uh, reference thank you ma'am uh thank you so much what i'm here to present is a new chat gpt powered ai chatbot that we've developed with microsoft research i would like to acknowledge them as a part of this presentation cataract surgery continues to be the most common surgery worldwide however there continues to be apprehension among our patients they want timely trustworthy medical information at the same time they hesitate to come back to the hospital and also are wary of asking doctors questions that they think are very stupid but that are very important to them technology today is used across healthcare we use robotic process automation in automating some of our administrative processes we use multiple chatbots even chat gpt has been used for patient queries and for enabling professionals to get relevant information the aim of our study was to develop a unique chatbot that could reduce preoperative apprehension in our patients and also improve their overall experience it was a prospective study where we included patients who were coming for the first time for cataract surgery those about the age of 18 and who had access to whatsapp they filled an onboarding form where we 
we got some details, including their apprehension on a Likert scale. And the bot was available to them for, from the time they were counseled for surgery till one week post-surgery. The bot, again, was built using multiple tools. We used the text translator because we realized that most of them would be elderly and may not be able to type or could be illiterate. So the bot was powered in five languages that are commonly spoken in and around Bangalore. We used GPT-4 to classify the question into medical, logistical, or small talk. Then the GPT-4, again, went into a curated knowledge base that had documents that we had uploaded that are relevant to our patients and would give an almost instant response to them. The same question would pop up to a doctor or a counselor, and we had a chance to verify that answer. So the initial answer, as I would show in the next slide, this is a short video that shows a patient's point of view and the doctor's point of view for the same question. So the patient is kind of typing out a question, very common questions in terms of when can I have a shower, can I clean my eyelids, to what should I eat before surgery, what time do I come, multiple questions were asked. So as soon as they asked the question, in a few seconds, we used a common key, so it took about seven seconds for the answer to come. But now that we have our own key, the answer comes in about a second. You can see a little question mark that's popped up there that says take a shower after 10 days. The doctor gets the same answer, including from which document the answer has been pulled up. They can type a yes or no. The patient, meanwhile, gets other suggestions. Once the doctor has clicked yes, you will notice that the question mark has become green. And then we had even questions like, when can I start eating biryani? It is very important to our patients. We may not think it is so. We had about 258 users, of which 127 were patients and 131 were the primary caregivers. Five languages were used as a part of this bot. 85% of the patients asked at least one question, almost around 1,100 uh, questions were asked. And these range, most of them were again medical questions. The kind of questions varied pre and post surgery from uh, surgical procedure related questions to recovery, pain, and when they can do other activities. Most of the questions did not require our intervention. Even in those that we needed to intervene, it was largely about providing a missing information or asking clarifying questions. When you look at the apprehension score, which was our primary objective, it dropped from about 3.4 pre-surgery to about 0.32. On an average, there was about a one and a half scale drop in the apprehension score pre and post intervention. What we realized is that cataract surgery does cause apprehension in a majority of patients. Most of the questions were proactive in asking a question because we prodded them with a first question and most were medical. Although information is provided by our staff, often there is some misinformation that can creep in. There are misperceptions and there is a limited retention. They sign the consent form, but they forget what they've signed. So this kind of a two-stage solution worked very well because it allows better accuracy and repeatability. And this allowed the patient to prepare much better. The tired model that we've developed worked well because it was reviewed by clinicians. And the attenders were very happy that this was a validated response. And over a period of time that we've deployed it, we found that the need for modifying the answers have actually come down. The limitation of the study is we've actually evaluated it only for a condition, although now we've rolled it out for other, other problem cases also. And the 15 person who didn't ask a question, we didn't go and profile or try to understand what the barriers were because of they didn't ask any question. We assume that they did not have any questions to ask or the attenders asked on their behalf because of which we were able to do this. Through this study, we've demonstrated the first possible GPT-4-based cataract bot anywhere in the world. This is free to use. The entire code is available on the Microsoft GitHub site, uh, which aids in creating answers to patients' questions by drafting responses that are reviewed by clinicians. And it does go a long way in alleviating anxiety and apprehension in all our patients who undergo cataract surgery. Once again, thank you so much for the opportunity, ma'am. Yeah, Dr. Kaushik. Um Two quick questions. One, that this was developed at Sankar Eye Foundation, so you're a doctor, so who helped in this development? Ma'am, we partnered with Microsoft Research, so we were looking at uh, preoperative patients of being anxious, and we asked them, uh, saying that what caused that anxiety? They felt that they were not being communicated enough. So to solve that problem, we said that, is there a way we can provide a tool to them that kind of allows us to answer their questions but does not give them complete access to us. We also want our privacy. So the chatbot was developed in partnership with Microsoft Research. So this has been developed in English now? Ma'am, it is available in all languages. With okay. Azure, the patient can record a question as of now in English, Kannada, Hindi, uh, Telugu, and Tamil. Uh, but the, it can be translated to any language, to any condition. You just need to plonk a folder with the knowledge base and this 
change the coding a little bit. It is ubiquitous in terms of inflation. Okay, right. Just a suggestion because you showed practically the first question was that when do I take shower after surgery and it was after 10 days. So maybe that can be changed to when do I take head bath after surgery because showering from here is anyways yeah. allowed. So for 10 days he'll be sweating like us. <laughs> so not advisable. Yeah. Uh, any so questions? From, uh, yeah. from this what I understand is that what you are doing is you are validating the questions which are put on chat GPT. No, ma'am. So chat GPT, if you use it in the form it is available, it goes into the internet, it can pull out any, any answer and give it to that patient. So that's equivalent to you Googling up an answer and finding out what to do. Here the entire chatbot has complete privacy built in. So this is on WhatsApp. The questions asked by the patients are sitting on our server. Hmm. So it is entirely the pipeline is sitting on us. So all the documents that the chatbot goes and kind of scans for the answer are documents that we've uploaded. It's our consent form, it's our brochure, it's okay. an FAQ document that we wrote up. We asked about, we collected questions from our counselors and all the patient care providers, almost about 400 questions over a period of one month that they got asked. And then we as doctors and counselors wrote up those answers saying that this is how it should be. And we uploaded those documents, so it's a very limited information that it gets. There were about 120 questions where it said that I don't know the answer. So it's not that everything it will answer. So it will encourage them saying to an extent, this is what it is, you don't need to come to the hospital. So otherwise they would call the counselor or call the staff, this saves up their time. Again, illiterate patients are very diffident. There is an asymmetry where they do treat us still like God. So they want to ask questions that in their mind they think are stupid. But uh, here they can just ask a voice message, it gets translated back into their language. But to me as a doctor validating it, it, gets, it comes to me in English, irrespective of the language that the patient has asked. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good use of technology. Um, any question from the audience? No. So the next presenter we have is Dr. Sumeda Watts. One time, one person betadine wash to hasten recovery in acute viral conjunctivitis. So Dr. Sumedha is the winner of Free Paper Community Social Ophthalmology Session 1. Congratulations for that. Okay. Good afternoon. I will be talking about one time low dose that is one percent betadine wash to hasten recovery in viral conjunctivitis. I have been nothing short of amazed when I use this treatment, says Dr. Ernie Bolling. But this comes with a word of caution because a topical anesthetic must be used. It should be an office procedure only. <coughs> Nearly seven lakh patients present to the eye department every year with viral conjunctivitis out of which 92% are attributed to adenovirus. It lasts for usually one to two weeks, follows a self-limiting course, and is highly infectious. The common complications are the pseudomembrane formation and chronic pneumular conjunctivitis along with SPKs. It presents as photophobia, blurred vision, eyelid swelling, ocular irritation, and chemosis. Focusing the spotlight on the star of my presentation, that is povidone iodine. It has a broad spectrum of action, high microbial kill rate. It has action against wide range of microorganisms, reduces the microbial load on the ocular surface, and used as the off-label management of adenovirus conjunctivitis. So far, there is no FDA-approved treatment for viral conjunctivitis. So our study dates back to 2023 in the month of July and August where there was an epidemic of conjunctivitis in North India, we got about 100 to 150 patients each OPD for two consecutive weeks. We screened 1,506 patients and 1,328 were included in the study. The including, uh, inclusion criteria was patients presenting on day one and day two of conjunctivitis and without any ocular comorbidities. Every patient underwent a, a swab which was subjected to uh, gram stain and culture, automated identification and susceptibility was done by Vitec 2 virological diagnosis was done by BioFire multiplex film array. Uh, so the result was that it was an adenoviral and an enteroviral co-infection. 
we divided the patients into two groups, 664 patients in each group. Group A received 1% betadine wash along with artificial tears, whereas group B only received artificial tears airdrops. Pseudomembrane F seen was removed. Follow-up was done on day 3, 5, 7, 10, and 14. We followed the no-touch technique where the patients were administered betadine, diluted betadine, serially in the OPD. They were handed over a tissue paper to dab off the excess of spillage, and they disposed of the tissue paper in the biomedical waste management bin. They sanitized their hands, collected the medication, and left the OPD. The outcome measures were in terms of signs and symptoms. Signs such as eyelid swelling, discharge, chemosis, conjunctival congestion, and symptoms such as blurred vision, eye itching, tearing, photophobia, and foreign body sensation. The results were as follows. Group A patients, nearly 73% of them showed remarkable recovery by day three, whereas group B patients, one-third improved by day seven, one-third by day 10, and the other one-third by day 14. There was no sequel as seen in group A patients, whereas group B patients manifested subconjunctival hemorrhages, 8% showed SPKs and 36% patients had burning and dry eye symptoms. So you can see the remarkable difference of day one and day three uh, picture of group A patients and the complications in the group B patients who, who had subconjunctival hemorrhage and SPKs. So to conclude, one time one percent betadine wash is relatively safe and reasonably tolerable. It is in fact better tolerated and non-inferior to 5% betadine and it reduces the severity and longevity of symptoms of viral conjunctivitis. These are the related references, but however, all these studies have tested the use of 5% betadine. 5% betadine has to be washed after administration. We didn't have to wash the 1% uh, betadine. The merits of our study is that uh, we have, the, the sample size is really big. All the studies that uh, were conducted so far uh, the sample size was very small, 15 patients, 20 patients, 256 patients, and they, uh, they, that was the limitation of their study, according to them. The limitation of our study is that we could have done a viral load serially uh, by PCR to check the actual reduction of the viral load. So with the beautiful eyes of Ma Durga and paying tribute to AIOS Kolkata, I end my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sumedha. So, betadine, actually, uh, you are rightly saying it's an off-label use, and in fact, uh, I have also used it on my patients, but I don't have any study to support it. Uh, yeah, so you prepared that 1% uh, eye drop in uh, lubricating. Yes, ma'am, we used yeah. the 10% solution, 1 ml of 10%, diluted it with 10 ml of normal saline and administered. Yeah, and on what days? So, uh, it was one time. One on time day, only. day okay. one and day two. And why we included the patient on day one and day two is because betadine is known to be the most effective in the extracellular phase of the viral conjunctivitis, where it inactivates the virus. And povidone iodine is the only known antimicrobial that inactivates the uh, adenovirus within one minute of contact. Okay. It also gets better on dilution. The antimicrobial activity of povidone iodine gets better on dilution. And the other study that we are doing is we are also checking the efficacy of 0.1% betadine to support okay. that, and we are getting comparable results so far. Okay. Right. So thank you, Dr. Sumedha. Any questions from audience? So that was the last paper of the session, I think. I invite um, all the speakers. I can see some of them are still waiting patiently for a photograph on the dice.